I will just uh, welcome everyone if you just arrived again. Um, as I said, uh, this is the third version uh, edition uh, of the Equip webinar series, and today our speaker is René Bernard. Uh, he works at the Quest Center uh, at the Charité Hospital in Berlin, Germany, of course, and uh, he will be speaking today about exploratory versus confirmatory research, which uh, I have to say is one of the topics in the Equip framework that generated the most discussion amongst the um, consortium members. So I'm really uh, enthusiastic to hear a recap of that uh, by you today, Rene, and uh, also I'm very interested in the um, input from the audience because I think this will spark a lot of uh, ideas and discussion maybe. So Rene, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Kim. All right, uh, let me share my screen. Okay. All right, so the usual question, can everybody see my screen? <laughs> yes, no? I hope so. Yeah. Good. All right, okay, yeah. Welcome to the third part of uh, the webinar series. And um, yeah, let's see what we can do here. So yeah, uh, as Kim last week, I want to start uh, with my uh, conflicts of interest, so I have non-financial to declare. Uh, just a small correction, I'm actually uh, the coordinator of value of open science at the Cluster of Excellence. Um, I'm just an extended member of the Quest Center, but of course I'm intertwined through uh, many projects, um, and one of them is GoEquipped. Uh, some hand-on teaching courses, uh, providing protocols IO premium service. And by training, I'm actually a licensed pharmacist. Uh, I, um, later on, I got my pharmacology PhD by the University of Michigan. And then, uh, yeah, I was a neuroscientist researcher in very different fields uh, for many years. Yeah, before becoming really interested in, in quality management, so I was part of the Equipped uh, uh, Network, and also I am a member of the Premier, uh, both of the preclinic quality management initiatives, and yeah, overall um, research value and open science is one of my uh, topics that I subscribe to. So, but before we really dive into now, uh, exploratory uh, confirmatory research, um, I wanted to take another sidestep here and talk about uh, one of my other um, interests, which is astronomy. So I studied in Regensburg, uh, Germany, pharmacy, and um, there you have uh, uh, this house of uh, Johannes Kepler. He spent his last year of his life there, and uh, we all know his contributions to astronomy um, and he was also a brilliant mathematician. But what is lesser known is his struggle, how he really got to these uh, theories that we all um, know about. So in his preface to Astronomia Nova in 1609, uh, Johannes Kepler uh, described how he struggled to find an accurate mathematical description of planetary motion. And like most of his contemporaries, uh, he started with uh, the hypothesis that planets move in perfect circles. And this necessitated extraordinary labor to reconcile the equations of motions uh, with his other assumptions, because he had bound them to millstones, as he wrote, um, of circularity under the spell of the common opinion was not the case that simply that Kepler really was a favored uh, the circles over the ellipses, uh, which he then later ultimately accepted, uh, since he uh, considered several other alternatives prior to ellipses. Kepler's problem really was that he failed to generate multiple hypotheses and end up then with the right hypotheses. In fact, uh, uh, Kepler labored for another seven years before he was finally trying to an ellipse and uh, realizing that it was mathematically equivalent to an oval and fit. As he recounted later, the, the truth of nature, which I had rejected and chased away, returned 
by stealth through the back door disguising itself to be accepted. Oh, what a foolish bird I have been. And, um, and I think in a way that's sort of a perfect um, entrance to our um, talk because uh, science really needs hypotheses to progress. Um, and this is also evident in, in the last uh, yeah, um, centuries um, that uh, uh, scientific progress really comes from testable hypotheses because the scientific method relies on empirical evidence to support or refute hypotheses. And in order to test the hypothesis, the scientists make these predictions about what should be observed if the hypothesis is true and then conduct experiments or make observations to gather data that can be analyzed to see if the predictions really matched uh, the results or not. This testability of hypotheses permits other scientists then also to replicate the experiments in their own settings, which externally validates uh, uh, the findings and ensures the accuracy and reliability of the scientific, scientific findings. Findings. So now fast forward about 400 years into the future and uh, scientists, you know, were still using hypothesis driven research, but maneuver themselves into another kind of waste uh, than Kepler had. Uh, scientists uh, were still producing these hypotheses, uh, but the underlying methodology turned somewhat problematic with small sample sizes, with bias-loaded research design and statistical flexibility, meaning they tried to fit certain tests to confirm the hypothesis that they had, um, with questionable research practices like harking. So like you adjust your hypothesis after you know the results and switch them out sometimes. Uh, P-hacking, um, not uh, publishing negative or neutral results or uh, transforming data was often used to reduce the overall variability to, to make messy data a little bit smoother um, uh, unblinded removal of outliers uh, do the same and can get your statistical analysis to this uh, p-value and selective reporting refers to the practice of publishing only favorable results while leaving unsupported results unpublished um, which uh, then ultimately leads to an estimate of 50% of published uh, results to be uh, reproducible. So, um, I mean, how could it really come to this? Um, um, well, due to an overall competitiveness in the system and that career and funding incentive systems have evolved to favor novelty over a confirmation. And for many years, the journal impact factor acted as a measure of this success um, and uh, as a metric for career promotion. And so researchers, while actually doing exploring uh, kind of research, use statistical analyses on them uh, and um, a p-value smaller 0.05 then usually produced a peer, favorable peer review and it got uh, published. Um, yeah, the current academic system would not have been kind to Kepler really lingering uh, seven years around to find the right solution. So he would have been sort of like uh, come up with his mathematical equation and published these probably uh, one year in. So disguising exploratory results as confirmatory really increases the chance of, of this high impact publishability on the one side at the expense of reliability and uh, credibility. Um, okay, so, um, uh, but now the cat is out of the back and, and, and with a large number of uh, research deemed irreproducible, uh, also many results cannot be evaluated anymore to another problem that is in transparency. So no methodological details, uh, no access to raw uh, data, uh, analysis code script, and uh, many also of them not uh, um, open access. So many researchers agree today that this crisis is real and really needs to be uh, uh, combated. But um, with a closer look, we could have really known uh, better because uh, it was known before. So that um, 
uh, hypothesis testing needs certain rules that need to be um, applied uh, to ensure the validity of the results and uh, the interpretations. And these concepts all the uh, emerged in the 1950s by statisticians and social scientists that uh, developed an underlying methodology um, that we know today as exploratory and confirmatory research. So Donald Campbell and, uh, for instance, also Jacob, uh, Jacob Cohen, yeah, Cohen's D, yeah, somebody heard of this probably, uh, are just two prominent examples uh, emphasizing uh, the need for rigorous methods for evaluating the, the validity of uh, research results, as well as the need uh, uh, to uh, generate new uh, um, uh, insights and ideas. And around the same time, Sir uh, Austin uh, Bradford Hill, uh, whose publication had big influence uh, on the future assessment of epidemi epidemiological uh, studies and led to the development of the randomized controlled trials as we still uh, know them today as a gold standard for evaluating medical um, interventions. Um, so uh, both uh, modes are, are complementing with each uh, other to ensure that uh, the results from them are uh, novel, informative, but also valid. And aside from biomedicine, that is our topic today, uh, um, I will focus uh, mainly on preclinical uh, biomedicine today. Um, we also find uh, these concepts applied in, in, in social science, psychology, uh, uh, um, and uh, marketing uh, research. And this graphic sort of like oversimplifies this here a little bit uh, and um, portraying sort of the exploratory research uh, with you know, techniques that we would almost see as harking and wonky stats, whereas really confirmatory. Uh, research is uh, a valid uh, 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 science with uh, confirmation. So, okay, let's dive into this. So, exploratory uh, uh, research. The objective uh, of it is um, to identify and generate really new ideas, key variables, theories, uh, research questions that can be uh, used uh, to guide further research. Um, and the goal is to generate testable hypotheses that can be further explored and examined in future studies. And one of the key characteristics is that it plays a premium on sensitivity. And that means that the research needs to be designed to be highly responsive to any potential change in the data or uh, any new insight that might arise. Another characteristic uh, of uh, exploratory approach is that it involves less stringent uh, research restrictions, such as uh, rigid uh, sample size calculations. And uh, this type of research is usually conducted to identify promising avenues for further exploration with the expectation that more research will be needed to fully understand and to develop uh, these ideas. As just mentioned, exploratory research needs to be very sensitive and uh, not overlook the potentially effective results that are missed uh, during uh, normally uh, strict uh, statistical analyses. Uh, researchers therefore want to avoid these type two errors at this stage by accepting conditions such as small sample sizes, uh, low statistical power, and a potential uncertainty in the data. This will ultimately, of course, increase the chances for the infiltration of uh, false positive data. Therefore, a result should always be approached with caution. And even if you apply statistical tests, the p-values under such uh, circumstances are often really meaningless and not suited um, for uh, decision-making. So uh, if you use uh, 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 statistics, um, um, how else, can't use statistics, how else can you approach, investigate uh, your data? Uh, you can do this really through a, a technique called exploratory data analysis, which is an essential step uh, that helps research to gain insight, uh, the data to identify patterns and generate hypotheses for further uh, investigations. And uh, here are, I've listed a few, few examples. 
um, what you could do. So uh, visualize the data. So it's a powerful tool to explore and understand really these complex data. Uh, again, several forms. You can use histograms, scatter plots, heat maps, whatever comes really to, uh, to visualize uh, uh, the data and techniques um, the best for you. So it's sort of playing around. Um, looking at outliers because um, outliers can uh, first of all affect your statistical analysis later on but also may either indicate quality issues uh, or even an important biological phenomenon so it's important really to to look at these and and go after um, checking on uh, data dis distribution uh, before performing statistical analysis it's crucial to check if the data is normally distributed and this can be done uh, through visual inspection of histograms or statistical tests. Uh, um, correlation analyses, of course, are pretty popular. Um, Pearson's correlation coefficients commonly used for linear relationships, whereas Spearman's rank correlation coefficient is uh, usually used for nonlinear relationships. Um, again, things when you can't really do statistical testing. And um, uh, cluster analysis, also very popular. So clustering uh, analysis can help identify groups of samples or variables that share similar characteristics. And this can be done by, by uh, uh, unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning or um, uh, hierarchical uh, structures um, and uh, or principal component analysis. Um, so missing data, of course, uh, affect the, the reliability um, 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 and validity of statistical patterns. Uh, therefore, it's important to identify and rest, investigate missing data. And um, um, last but not least, uh, uh, perform feature selection. Um, so uh, features that can help identify the most important variables that contribute uh, to the outcome again uh, here either a random forest analysis or also the principal components um, so how do you conduct exploratory research um, it's important first of all to label uh, these as such uh, and define really the, the goal of the trial uh, it's crucial to focus on high internal validity here and try to reduce the risk of bias uh, because the probability of already including false positives is already increased. So when it comes to sample size, it's important that you uh, have per condition more than three animals uh, or samples to, as a hint to start out. Um, to derive at least some conclusions and give uh, reasons how you came up with this number also. Um, adjustment for multiple comparison is not necessary at this stage, um, as the focus is really to generate ideas rather than confirm them. And instead of uh, uh, the analysis should focus on estimating biological meaningful effect sizes with 95% uh, uh, confidence in the loss. So um, one of the problem is, of course, to 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 publish uh, uh, these, you know, uh, because um, usually these are uh, can be challenging because you uh, have created something new with a great level of uncertainty, and you just sort of generated uh, hypotheses uh, and um, identified on some patterns that uh, were identified. So um, here are a few hints um, how to uh, um, do this. Um, so uh, we a, you should start with a clear description uh, of the research question and um, uh, a statement of uh, this uh, topic that you were exploring and provide the readers with, with that context to help them understand the purpose of your research. Um, to provide an overview uh, of the methods um, um, also including the data collection process or any analysis techniques that was used. Um, then uh, presented the findings themselves with a detailed description, including any patterns or trends or themes that emerge from your data uh, with the usual things, graphs, tables, and visual aids. Um, interpretation, um, 
yeah, here is where we discuss the implications of your findings and offer potential explanation theories why uh, certain patterns or trends emerge. Uh, but you avoid really firm conclusions here or make strong claims uh, since exploratory research uh, really was is not designed for that. And uh, you should also discuss the limitations and what you plan to do next, um, including uh, also um, mentioning the potential biases and limitations in, in, in your data and analysis methods. Um, so, um, yeah, it would be also helpful to mention where you go in the future with this, whether uh, you're ready, the study is then ready for uh, confirmative or confirmation. Okay, that brings me to confirmatory research, uh, which is uh, aimed to determine the validity of existing hypotheses or theories uh, by generating quantitative data that can be um, analyzed statistically. This type of research is characterized by rigorous uh, methodology and the focus on uh, reproducibility, uh, ensuring that the findings are really robust and reliable. Um, confirmatory research is based on previous uh, found group differences, uh, which are then further strengthened by describing converging and discriminant evidence that is generated. And this evidence really then helps to support the validity of these findings. You conduct uh, confirmatory research uh, when you do this, uh, it's essential to identify the experiments needed to rule out also viable alternatives. Um, and it's also important to uh, identify which experimental setup could use yield uh, similar findings, uh, which can help uh, to confirm the reliability of the results. So uh, during uh, confirmatory research, it's important to adhere to rigorous methodology to ensure that the results are uh, reproducible. And this includes the appropriate statistical tax, tests, um, controlling for um, confounding variables and ensuring that the sample size is really sufficient to provide these uh, reliable results. So um, from a statistical point of view, uh, confirmatory studies are more concerned with specificity, uh, which means that the aim is to minimize the chances of making uh, false conclusions. Uh, to achieve this goal, it's crucial to focus on type 1 errors, um, which is the probability of rejecting a true uh, null hypothesis. And to minimize this type one error, it's essential to use an adequate sample size, uh, which provides enough statistical power to detect the effects that you're really looking for. And high statistical power is essential to avoid also false negatives, which occur when a true effect is not detected due to insufficient sample size. Another important aspect of confirmatory research is to uh, reduce uh, bias. And bias can occur in many ways, including in the study design, data collection, or also in the analysis. We all know this. And to minimize the bias, it's crucial to use the appropriate methodology that we are all aware of, uh, randomization, blinding, uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria, and uh, the uh, appropriate statistical analysis techniques. So overall, one can say really the primary objective on confirmatory research is to minimize these false positives and false positive can be a significant problem um, really leading to uh, wasted resources or erroneous conclusions uh, that highly contributed to the uh, reproducibility crisis mentioned before. Okay, so how to do this? It's important again, clearly label confirmatory research as such. Um, again, this helps also focus the, the as uh, confirmatory aspects and not really confuse uh, these with uh, uh, an exploratory trial. Defining the primary endpoints is uh, pretty critical uh, in conducting uh, confirmatory research, um, as you need uh, to define precisely the measurement methods, the units, and the time points to ensure that you collect accurate and uh, relevant uh, data. And this also helps to determine if the intervention uh, or the treatment has a significant effect on the outcome measure. 
And when it comes to sample size, it's uh, essential that you use um, a calculator, such as, for instance, G power to estimate the appropriate uh, sample size. Uh, this tool also takes into account the effect sizes, the, the, the um, expected means and standard deviations per group, um, the, uh, the uh, significance level alpha, and also the type 2 error beta. It's important to use a really conservative evaluation of the effect size here, since exploratory effect sizes uh, can be very much inflated. Um, and um, unlike exploratory research, adjustment for multiple comparison is necessary during confirmatory research. This is because confirmatory research is intended to confirm or reject hypotheses and to require this uh, statistical significance and uh, uh, this uh, adjustment for multiple comparisons, again, to uh, avoid um, false positive results. So, uh, um, so really sort of how to do this best is also to use a template. And uh, in this paper that I mentioned here, you've also find a nice biometric form sheet um, um, that is shared um, in a site to the paper. I, I found it to be also a good uh, resource uh, for uh, people looking into this and start with this. So now we talk about the kit. So uh, yeah, let's look at the Equip system. Um, yeah, some of you uh, are in the audience that, that really helped developing the system um, uh, as a group. And when we did this between 2017 and uh, 21, um, which of course uh, um, contained recommendations for both modes of uh, research. Again, for those who are outside uh, the equipped system, I'll uh, just briefly mention. So the equipped quality system is an essential framework uh, for ensuring the quality of research in preclinical studies. Uh, and uh, they base this uh, on 18 uh, core requirements. And one of the core requirements of the equipped system is uh, that investigators must assert in advance in a written form, uh, whether a study will be conducted to inform a formal knowledge claim. And that means that the investigator must specify whether a study is designed to test a specific hypothesis or to generate new knowledge um, that can be uh, used to make a claim. And you see here, we use a, a different uh, terminology here, um, even though we have these uh, um, yeah, clear dis distinctions. Um, and the reason uh, for that is that um, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you often have uh, pharmacokinetic study, bioequivalent studies, or also uh, toxicokinetic studies um, that do not really have a clear hypothesis, uh, but can have under certain um, conditions uh, a claim of knowledge. And in these cases, really, the investigator must uh, explicitly state whether there is a knowledge claim, and if there is, um, uh, yeah, you need to ensure that uh, the study is then designed uh, to generate the evidence uh, required um, to um, support this. So uh, for this exploratory non-claiming research, the uh, design rigor is, is really up to the investigator. However, uh, for knowledge claiming research, a rigorous uh, design should be implemented and uh, deviations uh, from the design must be justified. So this really ensures that the evidence that's generated from a study is of high quality and can be used to uh, support the uh, formal language claims. So in the equip toolbox, then uh, um, as a major resource, you uh, can find this table that delineates the different requirements and uh, suggestions uh, for knowledge claiming and not knowledge claiming research. So, and, and please note sort of the differences, and there was also lots of discussion about um, some are advised to be implemented, um, others should be implemented, while um, some of these really must be uh, present. Um, and the information on these subjects here can be uh, also disturbed, uh, dispersed um, all over uh, a study protocol that, that you have that has many, many pages and therefore really hard to uh, be found and uh, to be checked upon. 
And missing some of these can be really detrimental for the validity of uh, uh, the study. And therefore, um, um, as a result, we came up with this study protocol template that uh, started out with um, um, this summary page of risk assessment um, uh, with these uh, internal validity descriptors that did you see here um, and to which we also had a macro from which you then can easily select yes included, uh, no not included, or if not included, then the, the reasons provided here and there. Um, so, um, and um, that was sort of the, the consensus here and the KIP side to this. Um, so on these items, you can already see one the last point here, uh, pre-registration. And uh, uh, so let's dive a little bit into this. Uh, pre-registration uh, is, is a commitment to conduct confirmatory research uh, with transparency, accountability, and rigor. And it involves the creation of a document that outlines the experimental design, uh, the uh, expected outcomes, sample size determination, and analysis plan for a study. So this document really pre-specified and digitally saved this as a record uh, in the appropriate portal, for instance, in the open science uh, framework, uh, where it cannot be altered anymore, but can be versioned or amended. Uh, Pre-registration is important because it prevents researchers from selectively reporting only favorable results or engaging in p-hacking, uh, which can lead to uh, biased and unreliable findings. Uh, and by this pre-specification uh, of the experimental design and the analysis plan, researchers commit to a really transparent and rigorous approach of their research, which can help really reduce the bias and increase the transparency and replicability of um, their uh, findings. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, you uh, can see also some some other um, um, uh, um, yeah forms here. So, for instance, the uh, animal study registry and also the preclinical uh, trials um, as uh, another registry. And um, so they yeah they came around. I think correct me if I'm wrong. Since 2017, and uh, these are these 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 registry the help researchers to, to uh, deposit um, their, their protocols uh, before they do a, a study. And it's all you know uh, con confidential. So uh, there's no stealing of ideas involved here. And um, it's quite yeah, uh, uh, detailed what is then, then asked about these studies and uh, what is documented there. But unfortunately, uh, I think up to today, only 137 studies are listed in one and um, and um, the preclinical trials, I think currently is just uh, a little bit more, 146 protocol. And uh, these are really the um, uh, numbers uh, that are worldwide because I mean, this is an open thing. And, uh, but even if it's local, you, these uh, numbers are really just a drop in the bucket. And uh, there were also initiatives from the OSF and also from our Quest Center to uh, um, encourage people to share with some, uh, uh, to pre register um, their protocols. Um, but um, unfortunately, it hasn't really taken up um, ever since. And uh, to to reach sort of like a critical mass or a movement, so that it becomes a regular activity. And uh, yeah, some uh, authors in the fields really suggest that uh, volunteering is not enough anymore. That uh, uh, journals and funding agencies really must step up and require uh, pre-registration uh, to ensure also that the research now is uh, conducted with rigor and transparency and we do not fall in this uh, re another reproducibility crisis. So how do you do this uh, pre-registration? Well, uh, first of all, you choose a, a registry that is fitting for your study. Um, then you plan in advance, you plan your st study design and research question 
um, uh, that the study is really feasible and the planned analysis are appropriate. Um, you register uh, before you collect your data and registering the, the study before collecting data uh, really ensures that the research is conducted as planned and any deviation from the plan is documented. Um, you need to include uh, lots of details, so uh, details about your study design, the research question hypotheses, inclusion exclusion criteria, outcome measures, and so on, and statistical details. So when you describe these things, you need to be specific, especially about the methods that you use, uh, include sample size and how you obtain the sample size and justify it, uh, um, the data collection instruments, and procedures of also how you want to handle missing data. You have to specify potential confounders um, or, or moderators that can uh, affect uh, results, such as, for instance, age and sex. Um, you got to follow the plan. You got to conduct research according to the pre registered plan to minimize the risk of post hoc data uh, analysis errors and um, selective. Um, uh, reporting. It can happen that plans change, so uh, it's important that you update the pre-registration if, uh, if necessary and also provide the rationale for the changes. And in the end, you need to really share the results of the study and not pretend that it's never happened, including also negative results or unexpected findings to increase the transparency and help build a more comprehensive uh, understanding of the research topic, especially if the research uh, took an unexpected outcome. So a step farther uh, than uh, um, registered uh, than pre-registration or registered report, which are also perfectly suited for confirmatory uh, studies. Um, so these registered reports are a type of research uh, uh, article uh, in which a study is peer-reviewed and accepted before publication, uh, um, sorry, before the data are collected. And the key feature of a registered report is the upfront specification of the research question, similar as we just had it in the pre-registration. But then this is reviewed by journal editors and by peer reviewers. And the research design that passes a peer review um, is uh, offered in principle acceptance. Uh, results are guaranteed to be published regardless of outcome as long as the research was carried out as described. And uh, that's great anyway, also to have a guaranteed publication and to reduce um, the bias. So uh, as I said, register reports typically for confirmatory studies, uh, but they can be also suitable for exploratory studies under circumstance, certain circumstances, for instance, if uh, the research question the hypothesis are clearly uh, uh, defined and the study aim to test these hypotheses, uh, use well-defined methods. Um, and um, however, um, the study is uh, primarily exploratory in nature. Um, so um, without a clear research question or hypothesis, then a registered report is not the best fit. So here's a non-comprehensive list of uh, uh, biomedical-oriented uh, uh, journals that offer these registered reports uh, and according to the Center of Open Science, um, there are right now more than uh, 300 uh, uh, journals, including um, other sciences that accept uh, this format now. And most prominent and very recently, even the flagship journal uh, Nature now welcomes registered reports, uh, which hopefully boosts this format even more so it gains uh, further acceptance in the uh, scientific community. And these uh, two-stage reviews, as uh, shown here, uh, become uh, the norm and that uh, yeah, there's much more focus on uh, the research uh, design. Okay, to summarize, um, exploratory and confirmatory research are two complete complementary uh, uh, approaches um, that can be used together uh, to gain a comprehensive understanding of a particular research question. 
Exploratory research involves exploring uh, research questions without any uh, uh, preconceived hypotheses or specific research uh, objectives, and it can help researchers generate new hypotheses and identify potential biomarkers uh, and investigate uh, unexpected association between certain variables. Exploratory research can be used for uh, when there is limited knowledge about a particular disease or condition or subject, <clears throat> whereas confirmatory research aims to validate or refute a hypothesis or research question and provide more conclusive evidence about the relationship between uh, variables. Confirmatory research is essential to uh, provide robust evidence to support decision making and to develop new treatments and uh, later also then improve uh, uh, patient's outcomes. Uh, exploratory research can help uh, identify uh, new risk factors or biomarkers, while confirmatory research can provide more conclusive evidence to support or refute these findings. Overall, if you combine uh, uh, exploratory and confirmatory research, uh, this can lead to a solid understanding of uh, the underlying disease mechanisms and their combined results are more likely to be translated into uh, potential clinical settings. Yeah, and with this, I'm at the end and here I have a few more uh, further readings uh, on uh, this subject if uh, you're interested. And yeah, with this, I'll just try to stop the sharing here and say thank you that you all stayed with me and uh, open for questions that I try to answer. Thank you, Rene. Uh, that was a really great uh, presentation and introduction to uh, various aspects of this topic. Um, I already opened the chat for questions. I'm not sure if there's any questions there so far. Or if anyone uh, has a question, you can also just unmute yourself uh, and speak up. One question. Uh, Hello. Actually, I asked there. a question. Yeah. I can yeah. ask here as well. Thank you for th this great pre presentation. And also, can you see me? OK, I'm yes. Bitsu from you. Turkey. Yeah, my question is, and in exploratory studies, yeah. and we may have small sample size, so if we uh, want to perform some statistical tests, so can we just assume that the data is normally distributed and press specify the statistical test and perform it? Is it acceptable? It, it's, I, I think uh, it really depends on, uh, on, on the sample size and really also on, on the distribution. So if we say you have only like three, four samples, you know, yeah. uh, it's 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 almost uh, throwing the dice so um uh, and and i think you have to ask yourself the question at one point uh will this really generate uh, um, a, a valid response so of course with exploratory it's it's really hard to to know because you don't really know what your extreme measures are but yeah. if you if you know sort of like where for instance a physiological range of mm -hmm. some other data where you said like, well, it must lie sort of like within these extremes, you know, I expect these uh, there and um, the, the data should fall in between. Um, then it, it should, uh, with this assumption, I think it can give you valuable results. If it's completely limitless, uh, that's going to be tough. Uh, uh, to and in this case, it's better to increase your sample size and uh, run the distribution test first, if it's totally unknown. Cor correct. If you have really no idea, it's uh, um, I would definitely amp, amp up the, the sample size if you can, mm -hmm. if you can provide this, um, because I mean, you, again, the, the every statistical test underlies is that you sort of grab a sample sort of like from from millions of other choices that you have to make so mm -hmm. the smaller the grab you have i mean the more likely is this that you have some sort of extreme and um that your your testing is then in the end uh, in, in invalid or or leads you in a in a, in a, in a wrong di direction so um 
even mm -hmm. though it doesn't need to be sort of adequately uh, powered, you know, at this at this point, because you don't know uh, what your effect size uh, will be, uh, and the overall uh, variance. Um, better start out with something solid, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, then um, use either the distribution, mm -hmm. but not just really the distribution of the data, because uh, um, this can also be a little bit misleading, sort of if you just look all the cloud, but do they maybe separate into different entities? Uh, mm -hmm. Then with uh, with associations, can you make what is so special about uh, the other factors that, that involve with these that they could sometimes separate or I, I don't know. The other thing is also uh, what relationship do you expect? You know, is it a linear relationship that you would expect? Is this is this a U shape? Is this something sigmoidal? And um, mm -hmm. then uh, where could you be at this? So initially, it's also a lot of of guessing work, unfortunately. Yeah, and you should have a lot of knowledge about the statistical analysis to conduct the exploratory study. And in, in this case, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Welcome. Are there any other questions from the audience? While people are pondering that, uh, Renee, I might uh, ask you a question. Uh, so when listening to your uh, uh, use of um, uh, terminology, uh, I think you made it very clear to stick with confirmatory versus exploratory. Then in the end, you uh, indeed uh, admitted that we also in the Equip framework use the term knowledge uh, claiming. Uh, so there are a lot of different terms. Also, for instance, hypothesis testing, versus hypothesis generating, uh, or it raises the question about what we actually mean when we say a pilot study. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any of these cases, when you were talking about documentation, I was wondering, do you feel that we should uh, group together in a way exploratory and confirmatory results in, for instance, scientific uh, publications? Or do exploratory results remain in the background or in the file drawer and we only focus on the confirmatory studies in published literature. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, yeah, um, I have a clear opinion on it and I, I'm all for <clears throat> openness of these because uh, um, even small experiments that, that, that you do uh, um, even, yeah, could, could answer some questions or could be, uh, um, could ignite something, you know, in somebody who reads about this for for their own research that you do not even consider at this at this point, and um, um, of course uh, you shouldn't really sort of keep these together. So there should be probably also and there are journals uh, that are uh, uh, devoted to this, uh, for instance, uh, uh, micro publications or where you have single observations um, where you can write these up. Because, I mean, um, just because they are exploratory um, doesn't mean that you just went into the lab and, yeah, did something that you thought was what you want to do today. Um, this, there's some planning uh, on the went to, to design these studies. And um, you were just open about uh, the, the results in, in nature. And I think it's perfectly valid uh, study. It's it's a good use of of resources, and it should be definitely uh, be published and labeled as such. And um, it could be exemplary for for others actually to do this. And um, yeah, later on it could make also a good reference if you later on publish a, a confirmation to say, hey, uh, I. We tried this a couple of years ago, and uh, that was our hypothesis that was generated based on uh, this exploratory data. So, um, yeah, uh, they, I think exploratory research should not uh, remain in the in the file drawer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. It's great to hear from you on that. Are there any other questions from uh, the audience today?
Not yet, maybe. So uh, related to that, maybe then a follow-up question, Renee, uh, and it also uh, adheres nice to the uh, question by Bittel before. Um, do you then think that if uh, exploratory uh, results are um, in a publication or maybe a data repository, uh, should the authors provide a statistical analysis with them or leave that up to the users of this exploratory data set that want to yeah. build their confirmatory studies upon this? Yeah, um, that's that's always a I, I think a dicey question, and um, um, I, th I think since the numbers are out there, you you cannot really prevent somebody you know doing some sort of statistic, even if it's a t test, because uh, I think we are all so conditioned, you know, to to look at these things and say like, oh, look at these distribution, oh. Mm, is this significant? Is this not? And um, so I, I, I think, um, of course, you should do your normal descriptive statistics um, in, on, on the groups. And um, and if you do your um, your NOVA or or, or, or p test or or, or your correlations, and even with the correlations, you can do the R square. Um, uh, I, I think it's just important that that you clearly uh, say sort of okay, these are the stats that we got, but due to the limit, the size limitation that we have, um, uh, no conclusions can can be drawn. These are indicators, you know, uh, of a certain something, um, or maybe there's no difference. Where it's like, well, right now we do not see an, any difference. Uh, but we feel still there's some circumstantial evidence here, uh, also coming maybe from from other uh, lines of evidence to pursue this and so on. I so to summarize, I would say it's not completely forbidden to do so, and if you feel it would strengthen uh, um, your your interpretation, um, you should use it. Uh, but then always with a disclaimer and saying like, hey, um, this is purely uh, exploratory right now at this point, and uh, it's, it's more of an indicator rather than uh, something that's confirming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially for the descriptive statistics, I think they will be informative to most users. Yeah. Um, because there's no uh, hypothesis that you've tested probably very uh, with a lot yeah. of power in your exploratory study because otherwise it would be confirmatory. Mm -hmm. The hypothesis that people want to generate from the exploratory data set might change between the users. So if I read your exploratory data set, I might get another idea that I would like to investigate than another user who sees another interesting thing in this data set. So um, indeed it's, uh, it's interesting that the, the statistical approach that you might use to get a grips on those data might change from person to person. Yeah. Uh, whereas I, I guess that if it was a confirmatory study, the statistical approach should stay the same and should be reproducible. If I give this date, confirmatory data set to you, then you should probably analyze it in the same way as I did. Yeah. Uh, would you agree on that? Yeah. I, I, I would think so. Uh, one, one, one could cer certainly uh, uh, do this and 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 go, of course, from an exploratory data set in in in, in different directions. And mm -hmm. if if you want to, can read uh, different uh, things into this. And I think that the the smaller the the, the sample sizes, I think the more uh, room of interpretation is 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 left. Um, but again, I'm as I said in also in my uh, introduction, um, um, and I think this is where we sometimes maybe oppose with, with, with Anton or so. I think it's important if you can uh, buy already Im Im implant measures to reduce bias, you know, uh, because mm -hmm. you know you will uh, conduct probably a type two error with these. So I think blinding is, is still I think something that if your setup permits it, 
um, sh you should do. And um, the same is also for uh, randomizing the conditions that you're testing to, to the animals and uh, use sort of pre precaution here. And this will then also help you, I think, in the, in, in, in the how you can interpret and also sell your, your results better. Yes, I think that's really would increase the, the confidence that you have even in your exploratory results. Mm. That's uh, it's good to plan it out. Absolutely. Yeah, and in terms of, of pilot studies, um, yeah. What's sort of the, the definition of, of, of a pilot study, you know? Is, is this sort of like more in, in a smaller version of, of, of a confirmatory study, you know? Is it, is it more exploratory? Um, I, I, I think there are different uh, thoughts of, of school on these. Um, but I think what's important is if you do a pilot study, you should always treat it as, as such and not what sometimes people do sort of like later on combine it with, with then other data and then sort of create this pool and so like we uh, did this study and so on. And um, I mean, there are probably, as you know, uh, meta-analyses that, that you could do with multiple uh, smaller studies, um, which are, um, yeah, no, not wrong to do, you know, so you don't need sort of like these just one big uh, study. Evidence can come also from a combination of, of smaller studies. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think most important is really to declare um, what, uh, what you did to document and then also to, to, yeah, to report this. Yeah, I think that's a really good advice to, uh... As tr with uh, to work with transparency as a, a sort of a driving force in the, in all your experiments. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're nearing on, uh, or we're exactly uh, at five o'clock at the moment. If there are any questions remaining from the audience, I think we can convince Renee to stay on a couple of minutes more. But I think everyone's just very in awe and uh, letting the, the, the dust settle after your explanation of the topic. So if there are no further comments, I'd like to thank you, René, for this excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I'd like everyone who thank participated you. today uh, for their uh, attendance. Uh, yeah, in two weeks, we will have the fourth um, session of the equipped webinar series, and um, we hope to see you there again.